Okay. Okay. Um, hello. Yeah. Um, this, okay. We're, let's. Okay. Now. Okay. Hello. This is Ronnie Sheila Moody, and welcome to my fancy lady music channel. Today, I'm doing this interview in partnership with Streetwise Radio. Um, check the link in the description for the website. And today, my esteemed guest is Latin music great Leo Rosales. And if you're not fam if you're familiar with Mr. Rosales, he has played with some great um, traditional Bay Area huge bands, including Malo and Carlos Santana. Now, Leo Rosales and his new band. Um, let's see. I'll let him pronounce it. It's Momotombo SF. Momotombo SF, and they're getting ready to roll. Headline the Raise the Roof Festival in Sonoma County. And proceeds from that festival are going to a very, very good cause. And Mr. Rosales is also a community activist, which we'll soon find out. So, welcome, Latin music great Leo Rosales. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sheila. It's a pleasure and always an honor to be able to um, participate in uh, these events and be able to talk to new friends and new faces. And, um, and to share our, our stories and to bring love to the community through the uh, element of music. So that's always great. You know, everybody has their talent, how they, how they share with the community, whether it's a poet or an artist or you know, whatever uh, activity that you do. And I'm grateful that um, God, higher power has given me the, uh, the ability to play music and to bring joy to others. That's wonderful. And where, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from South San Francisco. From South San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. But ten, we're about um, 10 miles out of San Francisco. We're actually in San Mateo County, but this is called South San Francisco. And uh, last time I talked to you, I was up in the beautiful, beautiful 9,000 feet of uh, Mammoth Lake, California, which was just wonderful. How cool is that? I know you're Music takes you to a lot of beautiful and exciting places. And you can start by, tell us where you're from and how you got involved in the music. Uh, I'm born and raised, uh, birthday is nine, uh, March 1st, 1954, which makes me the young age of 68. Um, wow. right? But I was born in San Francisco at Mary's Health Hospital uh, on Divisadero. And I was born to two beautiful uh, parents that were born in Central America in a, in a country called, or, or a, a city called Managua, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And um, my father was a radio broadcaster there and my uncle was a musician and they immigrated into the United States and I would say the mid forties. And, um, and then, you know, once they settled here my grandmother brought all of her children and uh, my, my mom's mom brought her children. My father's mom brought his children, their children. And we all, you know, moved in one neighborhood. Down the street was mom's folks and down the street, the other side was my dad's folks. Wow. And we all grew up together that way. And um, my father, like I said, he was a radio broadcaster. So when he came to the United States, he started working at a radio station called KOFY, Coffee Radio. And that was before it became a conglomerate and became a big station. Um, it was just a little station on 24th and Mission in the attic of a uh, rancho. rancho. Mi rancho was a place where they, you know, Latin, Latin food. Um, and then my tío Edgar Rosales, he was a, um, a singer and a percussionist, played conga drums, maracas, and what have you. And he played with the great Cal Jader, who was from the Bay Area and who brought, uh, who made awareness of uh, Latin jazz music. And those were the days when Tito Puente, Mongo Santa Maria, um, Armando Peraza, all those uh, phenomenal musicians from Cuba, Afro-Cuban, um, when they were youngsters, Cal Jader brought them over, uh, you know, not permanently, but they were part of his orchestra and my uncle was part of that. So there was a lot of roots of music that, and you know, arts, my sisters played piano, other ones were, were painters. so. We had a lot of artistry in our genes. And I think listening to my dad and watching my uncle turned that, uh, that DNA switch on my head. And then I started finding that I really loved listening to music that was very rhythmic. 
I mean, I always loved like Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and, uh, you know, Fats Waller and, uh, you know, um, Count Basie and the big band and Duke Ellington. And then from there, as I got older, all of a sudden groups like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Little Richard and Diana Ross and James Brown. So that was a whole nother avenue. And then when the 60s started rolling through, we started getting groups like, you know, the Grateful Dead and uh, Led Zeppelin and uh, the Beatles. And before I knew it, I was uh, got myself immersed in music all the time. I was listening to albums and 45s and I had a, a, a drum set that I, you know, I imagined in my head and I put it together out of out of stuff, you know, and um, I started imitating um, what I was listening to. And I found that I had the ability to copy what I was hearing and it sounded sounded OK. So eventually I, you know, took drum lessons for a little bit and uh, and got my, you know, my my brain rolling in that direction. And that and then music became like the most important thing to me. So by the time I was 14 years old, we were in bands, we were creating uh, little garage bands everywhere and we were imitating, you know, the Beatles, imitating the monkeys, imitating, uh, you know, uh, the mamas and the papas. And from there, you know, as we crept deeper into the sixties and, and Bill Graham, the rock promoter, um, introduced us to even a different level of music. And that was during the summer of love where, you know, Santana and Tower of Power and, uh, Sly and the Family Stone and all these groups started to um, to come forward is uh, where I took the the leap and started to um, get involved with more musicians and eventually I got recruited into the band Malo when I was about 17 and a half, 18 years old. So right from high school, I went on the road with this group that had just received a contract with the Warner Brothers uh, company record company for five years. And uh, by the time I was 18, I was already out on the road, right out of high school. I mean, from the day I graduated and I graduated a half a year early to heading out on the road with Malo and playing all throughout the United States. And, uh, and you know, it's, we played on American Bandstand with Dick Clark. We played at Carnegie Hall. We did uh, uh, Central Park, the Palladium, Winterland and all these places. So. By the time I was 18 years old, I was had matured so much in my level of playing that I was I felt like I could actually, you know, uh, hold my own with whichever band I was playing with or whoever musician would invite me to come in and sit in. So that's how that's how it went, you know. And it all started as a as a young man listening and being inspired by by relatives and father and uncle and and uh, and and the genealogy of of greats that were in our family, you know, Europeans and Italians and Germans and uh, Spaniards from, you know, 17th century, you know, that came over on ships around the, the tip of, Cent of South America and landed in Nicaragua and they decided to stay there. So my family is maybe second, third generation of Nicaraguans, but before then, their parents who were pianists and violinists and singers and poets, they, immigrated through ships into that country. And that's where my parents immigrated to the United States from. Okay, great. And that's, that, <laughs> and that's where all your musical DNA comes from. Great. Right. Now, now tell us about this upcoming Raise the Roof Festival and tell us what bands are on the festival and what you and Momotombo SF are bringing to the festival. Um, the festival Raise the Roof, Peace and Justice is uh, an organization that uh, helps the less fortunate and is a, is a place of refuge to help people that maybe need support in different areas of their lives and that needs uh, support emotionally and are guided to, um, to people that can help them. So it's, and uh, this event is to um, help the, the organization have a strong, uh, um, strong post or, or a place of work that needs some, some attention. And through this, they can uh, guarantee to help people in a safe environment. So uh, in talking with Shakina Black, um, we, uh, she told me 
the the mission of what she was planning to do. And I asked her, you know, if it would be possible to bring the band Momotombo SF with, we, with her blessing uh, and support to come and to be part of this um, special occasion. And uh, she was very loving and very kind and felt that the music that we brought, being that it is uh, le um, legendary Latin rock style music that originated, you know, in part greatly by Carlos Santana in the, in the late 60s. And we, when we were young people, we took on the, uh, the torch to keep Latin music going. And uh, I think Shakina felt that as well, being that we're all from that era of time and how important that music was. And uh, sh we both agreed that bringing this music to the, uh, the Monterrio Amphitheater and to this event that we felt that we could really find support for the people. And not only that, but bless the people by bringing them uh, real serious uh, Latin rock music from Latin rock legends, from the Malo band, from the Santana band. And um, we have a couple of youngsters with us that we're hoping to encourage them to take the torch as well. But to, uh, so the most important thing for us is to bring love and to bring um, cohesiveness through the medium of music. And I know that there's, um, I don't have the, the names in front of me, but I know that there's four, four or five other bands that will be there um, that I think are from the area and that people, they have a fan base, like we have a fan base. So we're uh, praying and believing that um, like in the movie, uh, Build It and They Will Come, you know, uh, with Kevin Costner, uh, uh, Field of Dreams. Mm -hmm. I think that we just have to stay in that mindset that uh, we've done a lot of interviews and we've really reached out to the people to come on out and to support this great cause. And we're blessed that we were asked to be there um, because, you know, not to be, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, um, too schmaltzy, but it's better to give than to receive, right? right. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna give music and what we wanna receive in return is to see all the beautiful smiling faces on all the people that are part of the justice, uh, peace and justice, and to all the people in the community out there. Okay, and you could find the link to the Raise the Roof Festival in the description line to this fabulous, fabulous festival. It's happening this Saturday, August 13th, and where? It'll be at the Monterrio Amphitheater. And uh, that's in, uh, Sonoma? Sonoma County. Sonoma County, that's yes. right. Every yes, Sonoma County. And it starts, it's from 12 to 8 p.m. And I talked to Shakina today to make sure what time we start. Uh, I'm sure people will come there and, and enjoy the whole day. But if, if you come and you, know, you miss a couple of things, we will be performing from 6 to 7.30. 6 to 7.30. 6 to 7.30, yeah. Uh, that's that's wonderful, and fancy the fancy lady music channel is also a recovery channel. I've been sober since um, two thousand four, so this is a safe space space also for people like myself who are dealing with recovery. And in researching you, I learned that you are also in recovery. Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you, very proud. In the, in the corner, you'll see my recovery mentor, Miss Natalie Cole. Um, uh, in the, <laughs> so yes, so tell us about your journey um, towards recovering your struggle with addiction during your early music years. Well, during, you know, uh, I was born in the summer of love, or I wasn't born, but I was, you know, around for the summer of love. And uh, from a very young age, you know, we started experimenting with you know, smoking marijuana and, and, you know, drinking beer and things that we thought were, you know, the adults did it and it was okay for us to, you know, secretly do it. And, and uh, never knowing that some of us would turn on the, the gene of addiction in ourselves and others would be able to say, oh, this is too much foolishness. I'm going to go back to school or I'm going to do this and do something positive. Uh, and I thought I was one of those individuals that was able to 
you know, uh, put things aside if they would get too out of control or started feeling like, you know, there's something uh, negative transpiring every time I do this. Um, so, you know, I think I started um, fooling around with experimentation. You know, I would say around 19, you know, 68, 69, maybe 12, 13 years old. I remember going to early rock and roll concerts and, you know, the hippies and the whole scene just catered to that. And it seemed okay. It seemed like it, there was nothing wrong with what was going on. Um, but as I got, it, you know, got into music and back in, in when we were like just in high school still, you know, we'd go, we, we weren't mischievous young people in the sense that we didn't go out and, and hurt people or destroy property or have trouble with the police. You know, we went to somebody's house and we found a garage and we would bring our instruments and we would play all hours. And along with that came, you know, we'd smoke, you know, we smoke weed and then play music. And then, you know, then the weekends would come and we'd go do, you know, bar mitzvahs, baptisms, or uh, someone's birthday party for any reason. Give us a reason to play music and we would go out there and play. And, and unfortunately, part of the landscape was, you know, getting high or getting intoxicated somehow. And then eventually, um, you know, not, there was no problem with it, really. You know, I was living at home, everything's fine. And then I got into, uh, you know, started getting to a higher level of music. And, you know, the, uh, the, 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 use, the using started to increase. And I, um, and, you know, I started to have consequences. Like I got, you know, in Catholic school, I got in, in trouble for selling, you know, little joints to the, you know, to, to, to the students and I got caught. And it was like, you know, maybe, maybe something's not right about that. But I just, you know, played it off and, and continued on. And, and I tried to get into Catholic school, but being that I got in trouble in grammar Catholic school, they, you know, put a red flag on my name. So when I took the test to go to high, Catholic high school, you know, unfortunately, there was another consequence that should have woke me up. But I just said, hey, you know, forget that. I'll just move on. So I went to public school, which I enjoyed. You know, I met, you know, all of our friends were there and a lot of the musical people were there. So, you know, that was part of the landscape and that was part of the, the diet. You know, it was like going to school, you know, getting high and playing music, but never hurting anyone individually. It was just like a group of, of you know, it was like a group of people that, you know, um, you know, just, you know, try to play it as safe as possible. And eventually got into Malo and um, I remember making a, 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 a prayer, <laughs> praying to the higher power saying, if you let me play with this band, I promise I will be sober as a judge. The, the, you'll never see me ever again, wow. you know, with, with nothing but water in my hands. And um, yeah, the, I, and I'm sure the higher power was looking at me going, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> right, right. Right? So, um, so I went off to play with Malo. And I remember saying goodbye to my mom. I was like 18 years old, lived in San Francisco. And all the musicians in the bands were probably three or four years older than me. So they were like maybe 21, 22 years old. And, you know, I know that's, you know, some of the older players were already 23, 24, 25. And I was a young kid. I was only 18 years old. So once I made it in, once we were on tour, once we were flying to New York City, you know, I, I kind of like... Uh, like I looked at God and said, I was just kidding, you know. <laughs> you know, I, it's like, come on, give me a break here. I'm, you know, I'm traveling, I'm a rock star, you know, I'm gonna have a good time and, you know, I'll be cool about it. I won't, you know, I won't hurt myself or hurt anybody along the way. So as time went on and as we got more popular, the, uh, the consequences and the outcomes started to become very negative. And the, the, the love and the, that I had for music when I was a young man, that that passion and that desire to always play and to be a better player and to put myself in the position of growth with other fine musicians, uh, that started to become more of a, ah, we'll do that later. First of all, I need to go take care of business, you know? And then that eventually um, started to affect my talent. It wasn't as sharp and it wasn't as accurate as it was in the beginning starting to become forgetful, starting to become sloppy and, and starting to uh, waste monetary, you know, uh, waste money on, on nonsense. So all of that happened and it just finally, you know, to, to 
you know, without all the, the drug log and all that stuff. Um, eventually, I ended up quitting Malo and uh, I uh, very impulsively met this woman who turned to be mother of my two girls and we were married for 10 years and we were in a situation where, you know, uh, I was abstinent, not, uh, it, it, I was in an environment where there was nothing like that going on. So it was kind of easy to stay away from it because I saw that while I was doing it in the, before that, that, that would make life out of control. So I put myself in a situation, which I call a cult and uh, where I gave up my voice and I started listening to others telling me what to do and others telling me what to believe and others telling me what I could do and what I couldn't do. And that kind of kept me in line for about 10 years. And eventually that became like a, a snake oil salesperson that was leading the group. And I finally realized that I was in the wrong place and I had lost 10 years of valuable time. I mean, I had my daughters there, so I had them. And, um, but when I left there, it, it, my whole life imploded. And uh, cause I had been there for 10 years. So by the time that, came to an end, I had burned all the music bridges that I had created when I was playing with Malo and I was with, you know, friends with Santana and playing with them and touring with Grateful Dead and touring, not Grateful Dead, I'm sorry, with 10 years after Quicksilver Messenger Service and all the great things that were happening. I, my thinking got clouded and all those things were not important anymore. So when I was in this other organization, uh, after I realized that I was, my life was just going by me and it, it turned out to be a, uh, a very dogmatic, um, uh, fundamental, fanatical place that I had put myself in with my ex-wife and my children. And when I left there, uh, I was very lost and I was very confused and it was very resentful that I had given up so much because in, in between those 10 years, I had the opportunity to play with Santana. He called me and asked me to be in his band. And um, because of the, the people that were running that organization, they instilled fear and instilled uh, that those desires of the world were not of, of above. So I didn't have any mentors and I didn't have you know anybody to guide me and to help me to make that decision and help create a roadmap of recovery or to, to help me in any way to, to be what I always wanted to be, which was a, uh, um, uh, I remember going to see Santana at the Fillmore West and, um, and the enlightenment that I felt from the music, it just penetrated my very being. You know, it wasn't like a sensual, you know, physical, you know, heathenistic type of, uh, of experience. This was like a deep opening up my soul and my spirit to what I was supposed to be doing was just to play music and to create and to be a creator and not to be a victim. And um, <sighs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and um, so, you know, I, I, when I left that place, I left with those feelings, you know, I, didn't ha I hadn't processed them. So I was like, you know, in, in deep turmoil and then the marriage imploded. And then uh, there was just, you know, um, consequences from bad behavior. You know, now we're not in, in this corral of this place anymore. So now it's like, yeah, uh, just start doing everything and drinking and smoking and carrying on after being, you know, abstinently sober for 10 years. But and then when the gates were open and the, the, as they say, the grill is out of the cage and the doing the dance before I knew it, I was deeply involved in uh, the use of cocaine and the use of, of drinking and the use of you know, marijuana didn't even really mean anything, you know, when I was doing cocaine and drinking and all that, that was like the most powerful thing. Cause I, when I got high, I wanted to really get high. I didn't want to just like, you know, you know, uh, Toys R Us high. I wanted, you know, the real deal, you know what I'm saying? So I surrounded myself with that so that I could find that. And I found it okay, but I found it at the bottom of the abyss and the, you know, I went on, it went on for 20 years after I left that place. And uh, I didn't find, you know, I, I would try to, you know, 
white knuckle it and it lasts for a couple of days or just like, uh, you know, just cry with guilt and shame. And when that would go away, it was, it was just a roller coaster ride of, you know, what we know of insanity, repeating the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. You know, and I worked at a hotel. I became, you know, as an engineer there. And I, for many years, I would get intoxicated there before or after in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, blah, blah, blah didn't matter. Um, so, and then what, what brought me to recovery, finally, after all of that nonsense, and you know, you know the story, yeah, yeah. and that is that uh, I was introduced to crystal meth. And I started to smoke that for, you know, maybe two and a half, three years. And that is really what took me to the bottom of the, the into the depths of darkness and despair. And around that time, my mom got sick. She, she developed, that's all right. She developed a brain tumor. And I was, uh, and I had, and I was in relapse mode because I had spent five weeks at a, at Newbridge, which is here in uh, in Berkeley, and I spent five weeks there, and I thought it was okay. I thought I was gonna be able to leave, and okay, I'm better now, you know. But you know, one day, eight weeks out, out of there, I made a reservation. You know, you know what the how that goes. I made a reservation in my head, and I was going to that restaurant. I was buying that meal, and that's exactly what I did. And um, I, when I, when I started to smoke the meth again, I was like unstoppable. I was just absolutely at the, at the pits of insanity. And that went on for maybe a month. And then uh, my mom died and God was merciful enough to let me be the last person that was with her. Wow. And I, and I, and I took that as a sign that out of, out of all the people mm -hmm. that were with her at the end, that for that person to be me mm -hmm. was a message that not only did God love me, but that my mother loved me and that they, they understood and that they wanted th that love for me to understand that, look, you get to see me. You're sick right now. You're sick right now. I'm dying, but I want you to know that I forgive you and I love you and you're going to be okay. And then in the morning she died. Wow. I went, you know, we, we buried her and I was just completely in a state of mourning and sadness and deep despair. And then when I went back to work, I remembered all the things I had learned at Newbridge and I got down on my knees and I just said the three steps. You know, God grant me the serenity, you know, turn my will and my life over the care of God as I understand him. Relieve me from the obsession and the compulsion to use. I'm sound begging you. Mm -hmm. Said I don't want it no more. Mm -hmm. And that was 18 and a half years ago. And I haven't had I haven't had a relapse, a smoke, a drink, a pill. My recovery has been strong for 18 and a half years. Congratulations. And, yes. And music has been a gift. My kids, my grandkids, my wife, um, the little bit of money that I, 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 I was talking to Virginia the other day. I said, you said, you remember the days where I couldn't find a nickel for the bus? Uh -huh. I had to go to work and I couldn't find change for the bus because I, I drank it all. I said, now I got. I can leave $20 for a tip. I can leave, you know, I can tip the waitress. I can tip this guy. I can buy myself a nice little shirt or a nice, I said, miracles do happen and, and recovery is, is a powerful thing. It is, it is powerful. So that's my recovery story. And then all of that has led to playing music again, sober, which I thought I could never do. Uh -huh. and, uh, my wife took me to a, to this nice club. It was a nice club. It wasn't one of those sleazy down, you know, just a nice little place because a friend of mine had invited me to play, but I was so apprehensive of picking up sticks, standing with a group of guys that felt the, the major imposter syndrome, like, oh my God, I can't do this. And, and she just held my hand and says, yes, you can. You can do wow. it. Wow. Just get up there and play. There's hardly anybody in the joint, but it felt like there was a million people there. And she says, you can do it. Don't be afraid. I'm right here for you. If you don't want to do it, 
I'll be here. What a blessing. Yeah, and so. That is, and thank you so much for sharing this story. Some parts of our journey are painful, and but the more we talk about it with people, the more enlightened we become and the more we help others. Yeah, so, we can't we have unless we give it away, right? Right, exactly, exactly. So thank you so much. And on that note, where do you see Latin rock uh, genre, with, which you help invent, where do you see it headed in the near future? Uh, I, I see it heading in a higher level. I mean, now with you know the digital the digital world that we live in. Back in the day, we had uh, cassette tapes, and then from cassette tapes, we went to um, you know uh, uh, CDs, you know the Walkman, and then from there, now we're iPhones with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand songs inside. So, I think it's important for us older. Uh, legendary Latin rock players to uh, allow the youngsters to interpret the music uh, in their way, never, but never losing the essence of what Latin rock is. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's different than rock and roll. It's different than Afro-Cuban music. It's different than salsa. It's different than, uh, than uh, you know, country or whatever. It's, it's a mixture of years and years of people from Africa going to Europe, learning classical music, reinterpreting that music into Afro-Cuban rhythmic uh, danzon music or uh, salsa music. And it just came from, from these deep roots of you know, where man originated from. And if we can keep that spirit of rhythm not digital rhythm, not rhythm that I program on a box with my fingers and then just hit play and whatever comes out is what I'm gonna use. But the rhythms and the beats that come from the recesses of our soul, the way our heart beats when it's afraid, the way our heart beats when it's in love, the way our heart beats when we're running, all of those are rhythms that we, that we interpret into music. And I think that is hopefully where we are headed because we need to stay real. Mm -hmm. We can't turn into robots. We can't let robots write music. Right, right. And then it isn't music, it's just digital information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to instill to them through, through sound, through rhythm and through stories so that they always search for it. Because it, you'll ne you're never really gonna find it because mm -hmm. it's like magic. And then when you do tap into something and something comes from it, like when Malo wrote all those beautiful songs, like Nena, Cafe, Pana, Suavecito, uh, Momotombo, Latin Boogaloo, those are like, those come from the depths of young people. Mm -hmm. Those weren't written by 48, 50, 60 year old men. Those were written by kids right. and they're great songs. So that's what I feel that we're headed to because there's, there's, a, you know, there may be a generation of young people that are confused and lost, and, and, um, and, ha and doing things that have negative outcomes. But then there are those beautiful young people that are dedicated to education and dedicated to finding, no matter how hard it is, like climbing Mount Everest. But each part of the journey, there's going to be a realization of the music, and. That's my hope and prayer that that's where the music translates into. That robots can make cars, uh, right? Cars and lawns and vacuum, uh, but the human beings continue to listen to their heart right. and to create music from that place. Right from the heart. That is that's, from the heart. from the heart. That's beautiful. And my last before we close, we're going to get into the fun part of the fancy. Lady Music Channel and where we each show up. Name one fancy thing that we're wearing today. Now today, I'm wearing this choker from Home by Ariel. Um, Beautiful collection. And these are two angels. I've been stalking this necklace for a while. Home by Eric. Home by Ariel. India Ari, Beyonce, Mikey Joban. A lot of the singers, the young R&B singers, are what? wearing Home by Ariel. Um, I lost two friends this spring, Tabby and Bunny. So it's fitting that the guardian angels 
you know, represent them. Very and meaningful. So your turn. So name oh, some fancy so thing you wear. Uh, this shirt, if you can read the label. Mission, this. Mission Food. Mission Hub. Mission Hub. Right, and then this is the, I don't know, can you see the, can you see the back? Uh-huh, yes. All right, yes. so this is an important shirt because Virginia and I were asked by uh, a gentleman by the name of Roberto Hernandez, who mm -hmm. works in San Francisco on Alabama Street between 18th and 19th. And since the pandemic, he has fed over 8,000 families. And wow. he can do it every single day. He gives bikes to children. He gives Christmas trees. He gives turkeys. Uh, he uh, makes birthday cakes for, for the, the people that, that work for him. So this shirt, Virginia and I have volunteered to go to the center and they fill our car up with food, like maybe uh, 10 or 11 boxes of food. And they give us 10 or 11 addresses in the mission and throughout the, you know, the Bayshore, uh, Bayview, uh, Fillmore, Tenderloin areas. And uh, we go out there, we knock on the door and we bring these people food rice, beans, chicken, steak, milk, you know, and when I first did it, I would break, I, I'd walk down the stairs in tears because I felt so ministered to by the recipient to see the joy and the happiness. And it's almost like they're in themselves saying thank you to God for answering their prayers because they were hungry right. and sent them food and we were the messengers. So that's what this shirt is, and um, beautiful. Very proud to, you know, to you know, I'm I'm doing the GPS, and Virginia's driving. I'll say, make a left here, and then you know, we drive down there, and then we just like knock on the door, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's sometimes it's 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 a little sketchy because of the neighborhood that it's in. I mean, I've gone into some areas where where the fellas are hanging out, and I got to ask them. I say, hey, hey, dude, where's you know so and so? And they've always been like, oh, cool, bro, it's right over there. You know, that's Mr. So-and-so. And it's like, all right, you know, nothing to fear but fear itself, right? right? So that's what this shirt represents. It represents a community of people that really care about the community. That And, and it's a beautiful, um, great story and also a very powerful logo, too. Thank you yep. for that story. Roberto and Hernandez. Yeah, that, uh, Roberto Hernandez. Thank you for your service to the community. So before we leave, I'm going to ask you to sing a few bars of Suavecito. Take us out. All right. Are you ready? Yes. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll do it a cappella like if I'm, uh, let's see, uh, uh, like if I'm Tony, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, I forgot. I got I get a brain freeze. Um, uh, okay. So I never, I never met a girl like you in my life. The way that you hold me in the night. The way that you make things go right. Whenever you're in my arms, girl, you're filling me with all your charms. Suavecito, mi linda. Suavecito. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Leah Rosale. It's on behalf of the goodness. Music channel. And Tony Street Bennett. Street. That was the person. Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. <laughs> Tony yeah, Bennett. That's, that's uh, another song, but that's for another day. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank, and thank you so much for sharing everything on behalf of the Fancy Lady Music Channel and Streetwise Radio. Thanks to the great, uh, iconic Latin rock star, Leah Rosales. And we'll see you this weekend. Um, raise thank the roof. Hey, if you're going, right. you better come up and give me some love, girl. I sure will. I will. Pal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have Thank a you. blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.